Hey everyone, I'm so glad you're back with us on week two of this study called Jesus Speaks. And I hope that you, along with JK and I and your small group, have really worked at uh, loving Jesus Christ in a deeper, more meaningful way this week. Uh, today we're going to move to another town, uh, an ancient letter that Jesus writes to the town of Smyrna and the Christians there. And he has a simple two-word encouragement for them, no fear. Today's discussion is going to be pretty simple because we're going to talk about fear and really all of us have some sort of fear. We're talking with the production crew here about some of the fears that I have. I'm afraid of heights, uh, afraid of snakes, afraid of spiders, afraid of mice. What are you afraid of? I was looking uh, on the internet and seeing some of the fears that people have in America. Things like claustrophobia, fear of tight spaces, or you know, uh, some people have fear of lightning and thunder and storms. Uh, all of us experience some kind of fear, so it's really intriguing. So we go to this church in Smyrna, and Jesus says this thing that he says all the way through the scripture and all the way through human history. He says, do not be afraid. JK is gonna introduce to us the city of Smyrna, and then we're gonna get to the study. Smyrna means myrrh. You can hear it in the pronunciation of the word. Bible readers are well aware of this, that there were actually three usages for that word myrrh in the Bible. For example, number one, for medicine. In Mark chapter 15, Jesus is on the cross and he's offered a mixture of myrrh and wine. Second, sometimes the word myrrh was used for perfume. Jesus as an infant is offered the gifts of wise men, gold, frankincense, and myrrh in Matthew chapter two. But there's a third one that's used that I'm most interested in, and it's the one that was used of myrrh for incense. Jesus' body, some of you will remember, is preserved by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus after our Savior's death on the cross in John 19. I say all that just to read this line from Revelation chapter two, verse nine. Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty and the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. I wanna lock in on that word tribulation. Some of you may know this, that Smyrna was actually a harbor city, a, a world-class harbor city like Ephesus, wealthy, academic, a center for ancient uh, worship, especially emperor worship. And that word tribulation comes into play because at one time it was used of ancient torture where a person was laid out on the ground and a stone was placed on top of that person and then one stone and another stone and another stone until the victim was crushed to death. So myrrh points us to a real death threat to those in the church at Smyrna. Polycarp, an early disciple, actually a disciple who was discipled by John, the writer of Revelation, that Polycarp was tortured and ultimately killed in this very city. So here's the question. How much is Jesus worth to you? Jesus speaks, no fear. Listen to Mike's teaching. Well, now that we've uh, set up our discussion about Smyrna and Jesus encouraging them not to be afraid, let's get to the actual text, the, the letter that Jesus told John to deliver to this church in Smyrna, verses eight through 11 of chapter two of Revelation. You've already read it in your small group tonight. I wanna begin there with what Jesus knows. JK's already talked about that, this, this idea of tribulation and poverty and slander. And we come to this, this phrase you'll see a couple of times actually in our, in our study, the synagogue of Satan. What, what exactly is the synagogue of Satan? Well, you know, the Jewish people worshiped in the synagogue. And one of the things you may not know is that in the first century, the Roman empire allowed the Jewish people to worship their God uh, like no other people. And they had the rights, they were exempt actual from, from emperor worship and the idolatry and all the, the gods and goddesses. They were able to maintain their religion. Well, Christianity was born obviously out of Judaism. So what you have late in the first century with a, uh, an emperor named Domitian who demanded emperor worship, Jewish people were actually turning in their Christian Jewish brothers for, for worshiping false gods. Uh, for saying that Jesus was a God. And so uh, Jesus refers to them not as the synagogue, which would have been an honor to a Jewish person, but as the synagogue of Satan. And they were actually, um, they were messing up their lives in a great way, as JK alluded to, possibly being put to death because of their reluctance to worship a Roman God, but at the very least, closed out of the marketplace, closed out of social gatherings, 
and they're suffering poverty because of that. And so their suffering is really, really extreme. I, we can't really paint that picture enough. But then Jesus says, instead of saying, hey, don't worry, Jesus is coming in and to save the day like you and I pray a lot, that Jesus says, it's gonna get worse. Here's, what I, here's my encouragement to you. I want you to not be afraid because um, Satan, the devil, is about to throw some of you into prison and that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you're gonna have tribulation. So he just predicts uh, those sitting in the church on that, that day when this letter was written, you're gonna be thrown in jail because Satan is gonna, he's gonna up the battle against you. And then there's this 10 days of tribulation. A lot of people have tried to guess what that is. Is it symbolic? Does it mean something for us now? Is it prophetic? Could be, could be historic. It could be something about a gladiator games. They found some, uh, some archeological digs that gladiator games lasted for certain days. And maybe the Christians were gonna be threatened in that way in Smyrna. We don't know exactly what it is. What we do know and what should concern you as a follower of Jesus Christ is that Jesus is saying it's bad and I'm not gonna fix it right now because this is gonna be a test and a trial of your faith. You know, throughout all these seven letters, we're gonna hear this phrase over and over again. Jesus is gonna say, I have this against you. And that's the compromise that we talk about in every one of these, these uh, lessons. But for Smyrna and for Philadelphia, he doesn't say that. Their compromise is not so much an inward thing, but an outward thing. He's afraid that they might compromise by being afraid, by letting all the stuff that's happening to them and against them mess up their faith. And so he says, listen, I want to encourage you not to be afraid. He's saying, listen, I'm not taking this away, but I want you to stand firmly through it. One of the things I've witnessed throughout the world is I've been with other missionaries in India and Morocco and Pakistan, is that um, the people who face death when they teach have actually st stood at the end of the gun while they preach. Um, they have an intensified faith that I long for, and I think you probably do too. And so Jesus is saying, I'm gonna make your faith stronger by allowing you to go through some scary situations. And he says, in the midst of that, don't be afraid. Well, how is it that we can fearlessly follow Jesus Christ? We talked a little bit earlier in this teaching about some of the fears we have, the phobias that we all kind of joke about. But the reality is we have kind of spiritual and emotional and mental fears that can derail our faith. Uh, sometimes it can be something like dealing with cancer or some illness with a family member, the death of a family member, or some kind of injury. It could be depression. It could be worried about our kids in school or being born or getting pregnant or graduating or marrying their own spouse. Um, there's really a, a lot of things that we can spend time worrying about. But again, all the way through scripture, Jesus says, um, do not be afraid. Um, the story that just always comes to mind for me that I use as a metaphor for my fears is the story of Jesus walking on the water. And that story is recorded for us in Matthew 14. You can read it later if you want to, but um, in that story, the disciples are rowing across the lake. It's windy, it's wavy, it's dark. They're tired. Jesus is nowhere to be found. And, and suddenly they see this figure walking on the water. They cry out in fear because they think it's a ghost. But in reality, Jesus says, it's me, don't worry. And in a strange turn of events, Peter goes, well, if it's you then, I thought you were a ghost just a minute ago, but if it's you, tell me to come out to you. And you know the story, Je uh, Jesus says, Peter, come. Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to walk towards Jesus. He actually walks on water until he focuses on the winds and the waves. And then um, he loses sight of Jesus and he begins to sink. That's a metaphor for my life when it comes to fears. If I focus on the fears of my life, the things I'm afraid of, um, legitimate or not legitimate, uh, then I, I begin to sink in my faith. But when I keep my eyes on Jesus Christ, I can make it through and actually feel like times like I'm walking on water. If I can, let me give you three things to kind of consider together as a small group as you um, deal with the fears that you're dealing with. The first one is this. The first way to, to fearlessly follow Christ is to name uh, your fears and just give them to Jesus. Name them. Maybe tonight you want to spend some time in your small group kind of confessing to one another and talking about your fears and praying about those and say, we're gonna give those to Jesus Christ. First Peter 5, 7 says, if you cast your anxieties on Jesus, that's the place to put them because he cares for you. And so let's just name what we're afraid of and say, Jesus, this is it, we wanna give it to you. Now, the other thing I would encourage you to do is not try to fix your fears, not try to solve all the problems, um, but just trust Jesus to get you through. Um, the reality is Peter had no idea how to walk on water. But if you just 
keep his eyes on Jesus, he's gonna get through that scary situation. And that's what Christ is calling us to. And finally, I wanna give you the encouragement to take it one day at a time with your fears. Jesus says in uh, Matthew 6, 34, uh, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Every day has enough anxiety of its own. And I will give you the strength to get through every day. The idea is, is that sometimes I find myself, maybe you're like me, worrying about something that's coming up a week from now or two weeks from now, a graduation, a marriage, uh, a, a meeting, a job situation. I don't know what it is, but I know this. I've spent a lot of time wasted worrying about something that didn't even end up happening. Let's just take it one day at a time. Every day has enough stuff for us to be afraid of. And if we turn it over to Jesus, it's gonna be better. Well, I, I wanna end here by the, where, where Jesus ends this letter, and that is just encouraging them to keep going to the finish line. You know that word nikao that means conquer or overcome or be in victory. Um, he actually adds another metaphor here and that's the crown of life. I'm gonna give you a crown. It was a, a, a crown that was awarded to runners at the end when they won the race, when they won the event. He says, you keep going to the end because at the end, I am going to give you, uh, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of people wanna debate what that means. Here's what it means to me. You're not gonna die anymore. Uh, they may be able to kill you and persecute you and threaten death in Smyrna, but there's gonna come a time where you're gonna conquer and at the finish line, you're gonna live with me forever. You know, Jesus is the perfect example of that. He starts this letter to, to Smyrna by saying, I'm, this is the words of the first and last, the one who died and lived again. He's saying to Smyrna, hey, you know what? You might, you might die, but you're gonna live again. You're gonna follow Jesus Christ who the Bible says, for this joy set before him endured the cross and is now seated at the right hand of God. Someday, if we get through our fears by trusting Jesus, we'll sit next to him.